uh, welcome to this next comp uh, seminar, one of a series that we've been organising on the subject of compression. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, next comp uh, is a UK program grant focused on developing next generation materials for composites in compression. A UK program grant is a large coordinated program designed to target a particular challenge. And this one is a collaboration between Imperial College and University of Bristol predominantly, but together with our industrial partners, UK catapults and our international friends. Uh, I am uh, the PI of the project based at Imperial uh, and I run it together with my colleague, Professor Richard Trask, uh, who's based at Bristol. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, who is uh, Frédéric Laurent uh, from Honora, the French Aerospace Lab uh, based in Paris-Saclay. Uh, he uh, did his original uh, degree in the uh, Ecole Centrale in Marseille, uh, his PhD in the University of Franche-Comté, uh, and then he moved to Honora, where he'd been working for many years, uh, including for a long period as the head of the Modeling and uh, Characterization of Composite Materials Unit and he's published many very interesting papers uh, which are extremely relevant to the next comp program uh, and so we're very excited to hear his talk on the determination of longitudinal compression strength of laminated composites using both classical and innovative text so uh frederick it is over to you thank you very much for joining us thank you very much for this very interesting so um, i'm very happy to be here and i would like to thank you for uh, me and giving me the opportunity to present the work that we performed at Onera. I would like also to uh, thank uh, Joe Gilbert-Sleeve and uh, Anthony David for managing the detail for that um, event. And I apologize for the delay due to uh, technical issues. So I hope you can see my slide. Is it the case or the small delay? It's good for me. I hope okay, for everyone perfect. else. Okay, so, um, like to talk about the determination of the longitudinal compressive strength of some laminated composite material using different tests and different analysis methods. I would like first to thank my co-author uh, Anne Mavel and Pascal Paulmier who have performed the test and François-Xavier Rizari who helped me for the optimization of the different tests that you are going to see. Just a few words about Tonera, we'll be very brief about that. Just to mention that Tonera is a public enterprise under the supervision of the French Ministry. Um, we have a budget of 250 million euros per year, about 2,100 employees, among which you can find 340 PhD students. And we are about 10 scientists holding an accreditation to direct research uh, as I am. Uh, so we are located in eight places in France and I am currently uh, in Châtillon near Paris. So at Tonera, we work on different scientific topics. It could be solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, signal treatment, uh, basic physics. For those who are interested, you can go on our website. But today I want to talk only about solid mechanics. And this is the reason why I would like to introduce the material and structure department at Tonera. 150. This uh, department is headed by Han Dankin and Florence Wolf. And uh, in this department, you can find eight research units. Three are dedicated to mater uh, metallic material, two to material, and three to transverse application, such as computational mechanics, dynamic resistance, or working at the atomistic level to understand the basic phenomenon. Today, I would like to talk about work performed in the and mechanical characterization composite uh, which is led by It's for me to make this unit, which I have had in many because we think that I'm going to use a skill I um, access it to develop new materials uh, to help we also advanced made from a different scale, microscopic scale, scale microscope for design. Uh, I'm plot. sorry to cut in, Frederick, but uh, your microphone is really cutting out. It's very hard to follow you. I don't know if there's anything oh. you can do to adjust your microphone there. Mm. Uh, so it's very sort of crackly. Oh. 
Uh, is the sound better? Oh, yes. There we go. That's yeah. Much better. OK, yeah. I apologize Thank for you. that. Um, so you just missed the, the ONERA description and I'm sure with the slide you have the main messages. And now for the scientific topic, if you can hear me uh, clearly, it will be better. So um, I just would like to mention that um, the last part, the last topic which is addressed into this research unit is the design methodology in order to optimize the layup of the composite materials or to perform topological optimization to optimize the shape. And as you will see, in this presentation, in order to develop new tests to characterize the longitudinal compressive strength, I'm going to develop new tests based on advanced damage model, and I'm going to try to optimize that in order to um, uh, study some um, specific feature which are involved into the um, fiber failure due to um, uh, fiber kinking. And this is typically the topic that I would like to address today. Um, today, I would like to talk about the study of the longitudinal compressive strengths. Um, and I would like to put the stress on two points. Um, I would like to make a state of the art of the characterization test in order to determine the compressive strengths of uh, um, laminated composite materials made of unidirectional ply. But I would also to talk about the modeling associated to that test in order to extract the longitudinal compressive strengths. And I would like to put the stress on the choice of the modeling scale and the choice of the experimental scale. Indeed, when you work on the longitudinal compressive failure, um, you are going to talk about the fiber kinking, which occurs at the micro scale. But uh, as I described previously for ONERA, what we would like to perform is to provide a methodology to our industrial partner to design a large composite structures. And in order to uh, fulfill these two objectives, which seems to be uh, antinomical, uh, we are going to work at the mesoscale, which is a good trade-off between complexity of the modeling, complexity of the identification process, and computational time. Therefore, the content of my presentation, firstly, I will talk about the different tests that you can find in the literature to determine the longitudinal compressive strengths, but I will also present those that we have developed at, at ONERA. Then I'm going to talk about the modeling strategy to analyze um, this test. And I'm going to talk about the, um, to talk a lot about the choice of the modeling scale. And finally, since we have a model and test, I, I'm going to design new tests in order to uh, study some specific features related to the uh, fiber kinking. Therefore, firstly, um, I would like to perform a state of the art of the existing test. And if you do that for um, longitudinal compressive strengths, if you take the standard, the European standard, you are going to perform a compression test on a zero degree ply. So in this presentation, I will put the stress on one carbon epoxy material, which is a T700M21, which is a widely used material in aeronautical industry. So at Onera, we have manufactured a 16 ply uh, laminate with only zero degree ply. You can see the size of the specimen, which is very small uh, in order to avoid buckling, as it is recommended into the standard. The loading is introduced by pushing on the, head, on the edge, and you can see the results. Um, you can see that we have obtained a rather linear behavior uh, until the final failure, final failure which occurs close to the jaws of the experimental uh, setup. Uh, it is due to the fact that um, at the end of the jaws, you are going to generate additional shear stresses, and there is a strong coupling for fiber kinking between in-plane shear and compression. And it explains why the failure occurs close to the jaws, and it explains also why we have obtained large scattering, because in this case, the scattering is about, the, the covariance is about 10% for the strength. So we have identified a longitudinal compressive strength around uh, 900 MPa with a large scattering. And this point is important, I mean the scattering, because when you want to design a composite structure in aeronautical industries, you have to use allowables. And in allowables, you are going to take into account the material scattering. And if I ensure the recommendation provided by the military handbook, I'm going to design a composite structure with a B value equal to roughly 600 MPa which is very low if you compare with the average value around 900 MPa. 
So it is important to propose the test where you master the uh, associated covariance, which is strongly linked to the boundary conditions that you apply to your composite materials. In order to improve the test, Lee and Soutis has, has proposed to increase the size of the specimen. For type A specimens, they propose to increase the length, and for type B, the length and the width. And as you can see, uh, you can see the results here, the average value of the strength remains the same, but you can see that the scattering associated to the test are going to be decreased if you increase the size of the specimen, and therefore, you are going to increase the associated B value. The point is that you cannot increase more the size of the specimen, otherwise, you will be faced to buckling problem. Um, another point is that you can also test, rather than just a zero degree ply, which is very sensitive to the additional shear, you can also test multi-layered laminates. And this is typically what we have done. So we have performed compression tests with the same experimental device that you have seen, but now on multi-layered laminate constituted with zero degree, plus or minus 45 degree and 90 degree ply. We have considered one quasi hydrotropic laminate with 32 plies and one oriented laminate with 20 plies. You can see that the behavior until the final failure is rather nonlinear uh, up to the failure, which is due to the fiber kinking. And we have obtained a rather similar material scattering than that obtained with the Costa and Soutis configuration, meaning a covariance evolving between 5 and 6%. We have obtained uh, a failure pattern, which is quite nice and um, far from the edge, from the jaws, uh, but not in every case. We have some um, non-relevant failure uh, for some uh, tests. Each test has been repeated six times. But the point is that what you measure directly is the macroscopic stress, the stress of the laminate at failure, and we would like to determine the mesoscopic strength. For that, you have to perform an adverse identification using, for instance, the classical laminate theory or more advanced one. Uh, typically, typically here, we have used the Onera failure approach in order to determine the uh, mesoscopic strength. The idea is just by simulation to pick up the longitudinal stress in the zero degree ply at the experimental macroscopic failure stresses. And in that case, as you can see, the strength is about 1000 MPa. So each Higher, it is higher than what we have obtained previously, which is relevant because now the failure occurs far from the jaws and the scattering remains quite moderate and acceptable. An alternative to the compression test is to apply bending test. And if you form a literature survey, you are going to find in the literature mostly four point bending test. But the point is that for such a test, you have some experimental issues. Indeed, you can be faced to um, overstresses under the loading bars, which are going to generate premature failure in that part, uh, while you would like to obtain a failure in compression uh, in between the two loading bars. I've forgotten to mention that the failure is due to compression because the longitudinal compressive strength is at least twice lower than that ob obtained if you perform a tensile test. The point is that some author has uh, um, proposed to introduce some paths between the composite materials and the loading bars in order to avoid this premature um, failure. But um, again, as previously, you cannot directly measure the longitudinal compressive strength with such a test. You have to perform an inverse identification uh, thanks to finite element simulation to estimate the strength. And these simulations are not trivial because you have to manage the contact between the composite parts and the loading bars. You have to manage the friction. And if you introduce additional parts, it's become also pretty difficult. And therefore, it's difficult to transfer that to your industrial partners. For this reason, we have proposed an alternative bending test. The idea is to propose a compression with pivot test. You can see here the experimental device. And therefore, when you apply a compression, the specimen can rotate. And the key point is to uh, change the offset between the mid surface uh, when you apply the loading and the mid surface of the specimen. If this offset is equal to zero, you are going to perform a pure compression test. If this offset is equal to half of the thickness of the laminate, 
you are going to apply a quasi pure bending loading. You can moreover with that test adjust the curvature height failure by changing the length of the specimen. What you can see here is that the biggest advantage of such a test is that you can observe all the faces of the specimen. And therefore, you can use a lot of instrumentation, such as digital image correlation, infrared camera, in order to determine precisely the damage and failure uh, scenario encountered in such um, test. And this is typically what we have done, considering again the T700 and M21 materials. Uh, we have considered two kinds of laminate um, constituted only with zero degree ply. We have considered a 16 plies zero degree laminate and a 32 plies zero degree laminate. We have performed that, um, we have doubled each test. And what you can see uh, is that first, we can perform digital image correlation on two faces and have a direct measurement of the strain at failure and compression, uh, which is pretty easy. Uh, with that experimental device. You can also observe that the, non, that the behavior is highly nonlinear, but it is not due to the um, uh, material nonlinearity, but really to the geometrical nonlinearity of the problem that you can easily capture with finite element simulation. And now, if you observe the failure pattern, you can note something which is quite interesting. You can see clearly two um, parts into the thickness, two different gray levels, each gray level is associated to a failure mechanism. You can see here the failure mechanism associated to tension and the failure mechanism associated to fiber kinking that we have uh, control with SEM analysis. And you can see that the separation between these two area, tension and compression, is not located at uh, mid thickness of the laminate, but there is clearly an offset. And this offset is due to the nonlinear behavior of the material in the fiber direction. I will talk about that a bit later, but this nonlinearity, you have a different behavior in tension and in compression in the fiber direction, explain why you have an offset of the transition between the fiber failure in tension and the fiber failure in compression. As previously, if you want to determine the strengths with such a bending test, you have to perform an inverse identification. And this is typically what we have performed. So we performed finite element simulation with Abacus code. We validated the estimation of the strain considering comparison with the digital image correlation. And also through the comparison with the load deflection curve. As you can see, we capture pretty well the different um, uh, nonlinearities that we have observed. And therefore we pick up the longitudinal stress at the experimental failure load, and we determine the longitudinal compressive strength. You can note that the failure occurs far from the jaws, and we have extremely high strengths. Previously, we have obtained for multilayered laminate strengths around 1000 MPa, and here it's about 1200 MPa for six specimens and 1300 MPa for thin specimens. The covariance is pretty low, uh, meaning that the material scattering is very acceptable because the failure occurs again far from the jaw and you master well your boundary condition. But you have to perform an inverse identification through finite element simulation. So to summarize what I have presented you, um, we have performed compression tests. It's easy to perform, but failure occurs close to the jaws and we have a large scattering. We have performed compression tests on multilayered laminate. It's easy to perform. We have a moderate scattering, but failures sometimes still occur close to the jaws, and we need an inverse method to determine the strengths. And for bending tests, considering the compression with pivot device, we obtain an accurate failure mode all the time, but it's difficult to transfer to industry because the FU simulation is quite complex. So what we would like to, to have is to propose an innovative test, meaning a test which is easy to perform in industry, which presents a low scattering, and which is easy to analyze in a design office with a classical laminate theory, for instance. If you fulfill these three constraints, you can transfer your method to aeronautical industry. The point is that uh, the only test which fulfills this constraint is the tension test. But the point is that we have tried to develop a tension test which failed in compression, 
by optimizing the stacking sequences of the laminate. And this is typically what I'm going to present you uh, now. So it has already been done in the literature. Uh, if you analyze the worldwide federal exercise, the first one, uh, which uh, was initiated in uh, 1998, uh, and if you analyze the test case number four, which is a tensile test on an e-glass epoxy materials, considering a quasi-isotropic stacking sequences made of 90 degree and plus or minus 30 degree laminate, you are going to obtain, if you perform the simulation with the model, the following damage scenario. First, you are going to observe transverse crack in the 90 degree ply, then in the plus or minus 30 degree ply, and finally, the failure is due to the fiber failure and compression in the 90 degree plies. Why we obtain that? In fact, when you apply a tensile loading, you are going by pressure effect to generate compression into the 90 degree ply. So you apply a tensile loading at the laminate level, but at the ply level, in the 90 degree ply level, you generate compression in the fiber direction. And the idea, in fact, is to fail. It explains why you are going to fail due to fiber kinking. But the point is that for this test, we have first transverse crack prior to the failure in compression. And we know that if you degraded the, the matrix, the fiber kinking will occur sooner because the matrix which embeds the fiber is, uh, um, um, is not so good and therefore you are going to obtain premature buckling. This is the reason why we have tried to propose an optimization of the stacking sequences in order to fulfill two objectives. First of all, we do not want any in-plane damage prior the final failure and we want that the laminate failure mode is due to the fiber failure in compression, which occurs into the central 90 degree ply. So to do that, and you will see the link with the introduction of this presentation, considering the different skills that we have at Onera, and especially considering optimization process. So the idea for this optimization process is to fulfill some constraint. We would like to test only thin laminates to reduce the material cost. So we have fixed the thickness of the laminate to uh, 17 plies. We would like to have a central 90 degree ply and we would like to ensure the laminate design guidelines. So considering symmetry, balance, contiguity and uh, minimum disorientation between contiguous ply. And we are going to test every possibilities considering every 15 degrees between each solution. If you would like to test every possibilities uh, for uh, a 17 ply laminates, you have a huge number of configuration to test. If you consider the symmetry and consider only uh, one central 90 degree ply, the number of configuration is going to be decreased drastically. If you consider the design guideline currently used in aeronautical industry, uh, this number falls down to 20,000 configuration. And if you consider that we apply only membrane loading, therefore the order of the ply is not important, you have just to consider 145 configuration, which is pretty low because all the simulations that we have performed are performed with the Onera progressive failure approach that I'm going to detail a bit later, but each simulation took at least uh, two or three seconds and therefore we can easily test all the possible configuration that we would like to uh, address. And what you can see is that considering the lamination parameter theory, we are able to determine that some confi few configurations, in few configurations, we are able to obtain first the fiber failure uh, mode in 90 degree ply before any other kind of damage mechanism. And here you can see the proposed solution. It's a very, it's not a so exotic uh, stacking sequences because you have 90 degree ply, plus or minus 45 degree ply and zero degree ply and you have just to add plus or minus 30 degree ply inside this, the laminate. So we have manufactured such a laminate with these stacking sequences, which is not so complex. We have manufactured six dog bone specimens. The idea is to have the failure into the central part. The test has been performed on an hydraulic testing machine, and we have applied glue at the free edges to prevent any delamination prior to the final failure, which will not going to affect 
the failure, I'm going to explain why it a bit later, but it is easier for the analysis. Um, we have paid a special attention to be sure that there is no transient crack prior to the final failure. For that, we have used acoustic emission, and there is no acoustic event prior to the failure. And we have used an infrared camera, as you can see, with a pretty high uh, acquisition frequency, and we have observed um, no crack before the final failure. Moreover, in one case, we have stopped the test 98% uh, uh, before the failure load in order to control by C-scan that we do not see any delamination or transverse crack prior to the final failure. So we have fulfilled the first objective. There is no transverse crack prior to the final failure. And now I'm presenting you the second objective, which is finally that the final failure of the laminate uh, is due to uh, fiber kinking in the 90 degree ply. And typically, to demonstrate that, we have performed a CT scan at uh, LMPS Paris Saclay with a pretty nice resolution. And you can see that we have observed uh, fiber kinking into the central 90 degree ply. And the kinking starts from the middle of the specimen and propagates to the free edges. We have polished the specimen through the thickness and performed some SEM images. And you can see that we have observed very nice fiber kinking in the central 90 degree ply as expected. Um, moreover, the failure occurs in the central part as we expected. Um, then you can see the macroscopic um, stress strain curve. And what is important to observe is the transverse, um, uh, is the transverse strain because the transverse strain of the laminate correspond to the longitudinal strain in the zero degree ply. So uh, by putting a strain gauges in that direction, meaning the transverse direction, you have a direct measurement of the strain at failure in the fiber direction of the 90 degree ply, if there is no delamination prior. If you analyze the test uh, with the OPFM approach, the ONERA progressive failure approach, by inverse identification, you can determine the longitudinal compressive strength which is here equal to about 1000 MPa. But I would like to put the stress on the covariance, which is extremely low, about 2%. Uh, the reason is that finally the loading is introduced thanks to pressure effect. And therefore, the maximal stress in the zero degree ply, the maximum longitudinal stress in the zero degree ply that you can determine by simulation, or you can also measure directly with digital image correlation that the maximal longitudinal strain occurs far from the free edges at finally mid-width of the specimen because the loading is introduced by pressure effect. And because the, the failure occurs far from the free edges, it explains why you have a very low material scattering and therefore a very low covariance. So just to summarize what I have presented until now, and we have performed classical compression test on UD ply, but the failure mode is not relevant, even if you try to increase the size of the specimen. We have performed compression test on multi-layered um, uh, laminate, and you see that the average strength is higher because the failure mode is relevant, and we have rather low B value because the scattering remain um, moderate. We have proposed a tensile test which failed in compression, so the, the average strength is very similar to what we have obtained in compression for multi-layered laminate, but with a very small scattering because of, again, the loading is introduced by pressure effect and the failure occurs far from the free edges. Therefore, the B value that we have obtained is extremely high compared to the initial value with a zero degree ply if you ensure the current standard, the current European standard. And finally, we have performed some bending tests and you see that the average strengths are extremely high and also the associated B value. And the question is, finally, is the longitudinal compressive strength a mesoscopic material parameter? Because it seems to depend on the loading. You apparently have one strength here and a different strength for bending. And this is typically what I would like to analyze in the second part of my presentation, considering a modeling strategy uh, which will be performed at different scale. If you analyze the fiber kinking and you perform a literature survey, 
The fiber kinking is an instability of carbon fiber in polymer matrix observed at the micro scale. So finally, it is a structural effect buckling of a fiber embedded in matrix, which is also surrounded by um, other plies with their own compliance. In the micromechanical model that you can find in the literature, defined at the micro scale, this model will depend on, obviously, the mechanical property of the fiber and the matrix, and also about the nonlinear behavior, especially for the matrix. A lot of models take into account the plasticity. It depends on the applied loading. So as you are going to see, if we are in compression or in bending, it will be different, as you have seen experimentally. And it will also depend a lot about the boundary condition, because we talk about buckling of fiber. And if you have different ply around or no ply around, meaning that if you are uh, talking about inner ply in the laminate or outer ply, I mean external ply of the laminate, you can uh, imagine that the boundary condition applied to the buckling problem associated to the fiber buckling will be different. And therefore, you have to take that into account. But again, as I mentioned previously, we would like to propose a methodology that can be applied at the large scale uh, in order to design large composite structures, even if the uh, mechanisms that we have observed are at the micro scale. For that, we propose to use a, a hybrid um, mesoscopic damage model. In fact, the idea is to consider a classical mesoscopic approach, meaning that you apply a loading at the laminate scale, you go down at the mesoscale thanks to a method of change of scale. For instance, using in a large computational uh, simulation, multi-layered shell element, you determine the stress and strain in the different ply. Thanks to a failure criterion, you are going to determine if there is some cracks or if there is some fiber failure in the ply. Then you are going to degrade the mechanical property based on continuum damage model until the final failure. But the original point here is to associate a microscopic, uh, a micro scale approach in order to update the longitudinal compressive strength as a function of many parameters that I'm going to present. Therefore, in the next few slides, I'm going to present you the um, damage and failure approach at the mesoscale that we have developed. And then I will put a focus on the micro scale failure approach in order to determine the longitudinal compressive strength. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the model at the mesoscale, which is the Onera failure model that I have mentioned previously many times. I don't want to describe all the equation. I haven't the, the time for that. Just to mention a few key points, which are important if you want to analyze the test that I have presented previously. First of all, you have to take into account the nonlinearity in the fiber direction. Indeed, you can see that there is an hardening in tension if you perform a tensile test on zero degree ply or a softening behavior in compression if you apply compression on pure zero degree ply. If you perform, if you apply compression on cross ply laminate, you are going also to observe this nonlinearity, which is elastic, meaning that if you perform an unloading, you are going to move on the same path than the loading. There is no um, dissipated energy. It has been uh, mentioned in many publications. So it's taken into account into the present model. And we take into also into account the viscoelastic behavior because you have many plus or minus 45 um, degree ply in the laminate that we have considered. And this nonlinearity is going to play a major role on the global macroscopic uh, behavior that you are going to obtain. So here, as you have seen, this model has been validated through different configurations for the T700 M21. So we have really um, validated this approach on different stacking sequences, um, which has been performed, which has been tested at Onera, but also tested uh, in Dassault and in Airbus operations. So now I go down to the uh, micro scale, which is, I think, the, the most original part in this work. We consider a, a model developed by uh, Jean-Claude Grandidier and Sylvain Drapier many years ago, which is a very simple equation, analytical equation, and this analytical equation comes from um, many finite element simulations that have been performed previously. They have developed a specific finite element uh, defined at the mesoscopic scale, but with a double scale kinematic in order to be able to capture the fiber microbuckling into a ply, considering the adjacent ply around. 
So this approach is uh, pretty um, um, expensive from a, a computational point of view. This is the reason why, based on this virtual testing um, uh, databases, they have proposed a very simple equation which can be divided into two parts. In the first part, you uh, see the classical microbuckling equation proposed by Budiansky in order to predict the fiber buckling, considering plasticity of the matrix, which is here um, described with the Rambert's good behavior. So this part is very classical. The original part corresponds to this part of the equation, which is called a structural effect. And it is typically where you would like to introduce the influence of the loading of the ply position or of the ply thickness, which is typically um, finally at the micro scale, the structural effect that you are going to take into account in order to predict accurately the micro, the fiber micro buckling. So for that, in the model that they have proposed, you have this equation where you can find um, parameter defined at the microscopic scale. But the most important parameter is this one, which corresponds to the characteristic thickness of the ply, which is really submitted to compression and which is going to fail. And this thickness is going to change as a function of the loading. So you can see that for compression, you have a specific equation for this characteristic thickness. It will also depend on the position of the ply into a multi-layered laminate, or it will be different if you consider pure zero degree ply. It will be different if you consider bending loading. And in that case, finally, you can understood that this characteristic thickness corresponds to the thickness of the ply, which is really subjected to compression loading. And you have an intermediate case where you have compression plus bending, and you have again to adjust this characteristic thickness. To calibrate the model, they have proposed an identification protocol based on roughly two quantities. First of all, you have to perform some microstructural observation to measure some geometrical parameters. Thanks to optical microscopy, you can measure the ply thickness and also the fiber misalignment. For that, they use a lot the Ugartis approach in order to determine that parameter, uh, considering um, lots of uh, image analysis of the fiber. You can also perform uh, SEM analysis to perform the same job and also to measure the fiber volume fraction and the fiber radius, which will be uh, also important parameter for the structural part. You need also to perform mechanical tests in order to determine the elastoplastic shear behavior of the ply. And for that, they use usually a plus or minus 45 degree tensile test. You have to um, to have an estimation of the elastic property of the matrix, uh, meaning the Young modulus and the pressure ratio, and the elastic modulus of the fiber. This is typically some quantities that you can find in the literature for different fiber and matrix. Um, finally, if you do not want to calibrate the fiber misalignment using the Ugartis approach, you can also directly uh, determine the fiber misalignment by inverse identification. So it becomes a calibration parameter in order to fit the um, experimental failure load that you have measured on one configuration. You assume that the fiber misalignment is the same for all the tests that you are going to perform because the manufacturing process remains the same. And therefore, you are going to perform blind prediction on other configuration of tests. So this is the, the uh, experimental protocol that we have applied in order to identify the microscopic model that we have used, developed by Jean-Claude Grandidier and Sylvain Drapier. So you can see that we have performed a tensile test at 45 degrees, calibrate the Rambert-Rosgood method, and we have used the tensile test which failed in compression, in which we are sure that we have a nice fiber kinking in the middle to calibrate by inverse identification the uh, fiber misalignment. Then we have also access to um, a CT scan performed on that material in a cross ply laminate, and we have just through the 90 degree ply um, determined thanks to uh, image analysis, the volume fiber ratio and the radius of each fiber. For that, we have developed an enhanced methodology to detect fiber within X-ray tomography in order to calibrate the uh, radius of the fiber and the volume fiber ratio. So now we have calibrated all the parts for the micro scale model. And the idea is to predict the different test cases that I have presented previously. So first of all, 
uh, as I have mentioned, we have used the uh, tensile test which failed in compression to calibrate the, uh, the model, mainly the uh, initial fiber misalignment. And then we have performed blind prediction in order to predict the uh, apparent mesoscopic strength uh, in compression, in fiber compression, for the bending test. So we have predict the failure for the zero degree ply bending test constituted with 16 ply and with 32 plies. And as you can see, the model is able to capture um, many points. First of all, you can see that we uh, describe quite well the increase of the apparent strength as a function of the loading. So you can see that for bending compared to the tensile test which failed in compression, we have an increase of about 30% of the apparent strength. Moreover, if you consider the two bending tests, if you increase the thickness, we have also captured the fact that the strength is going to increase. And this is due to the fact that we consider uh, what happened at microscopic scale. And therefore, we capture, we finally update the boundary condition of the micro buckling problem that we want to solve, considering the buckling of the fiber uh, embedded in a matrix surrounded by plies. Uh, a first question that we can uh, ask is uh, also that we have tried to simulate the uh, compression test on zero degree ply, and indeed we overestimate the strength because the failure is due to premature failure occurring due to a coupling between in-plane shear and uh, fiber failure compression. And this is why it is not consistent with the model, and it could be also a way to determine what point are outliers and what point are reliable. And finally, as you can see, the apparent mesoscopic strengths depend a lot of the applied loading and of the multi of the stacking sequences. And therefore, I, I'm not sure it is relevant to talk about material parameter as a mesoscopic scale when you talk about the longitudinal compressive strengths, but perhaps the uh, micro scale parameter used in the Grand Didier approach seems to be material parameter seems because they are the same whatever the loading. If you apply compression or if you apply bending, you are able to capture the apparent evolution of the mesoscopic strands. But what about for multi-layered composite materials? So again, we have applied the model to compression test on multi-layered uh, laminates. This is typically the laminate that I have present at the beginning of this presentation. So a quasi-isotropic laminate and an oriented laminate with lots of zero degree ply. And you can see that we have updated the, with a the micro scale approach the apparent longitudinal compressive strength and the, pre, the blind predictions that we have performed are in pretty good agreement with the experimental data that we have generated. So I've presented you some tests, some modeling, and now the idea is to go a bit further and try to design some specific tests to address some specific features associated to the compressive strengths. First of all, you have already seen this slide where I present the uh, micro-mechanical approach developed by Jean-Claude Grandidier. But as I have mentioned, if you perform a compression test, the characteristic thickness is different if, the, if you consider an outer zero degree ply or an inner zero degree ply. And you can see that the characteristic stick, um, thickness is equal to the double of the real thickness if you consider a zero degree ply as an outer ply. It can be, um, it is rather similar to what you can uh, observe for transverse crack if you consider the approach developed by uh, uh, Dvorak and then uh, Camagno. You double the thickness and it fits quite well the experimental data. It is apparently the same, but the, the physical reason behind is completely different. But for that reason, we have designed uh, additional tests where we have manufactured a cross ply laminate with outer zero degree ply and a quasi isotropic laminate with inner degree ply inner degree ply. The point is that this uh, test campaign has not been performed on the T7 and well M21, but on another material, which is a carbon thermoplastic material named TC1225. Uh, in fact, it is a, a composite material with carbon fiber, which is still T7 and well, the same fibers than previously, but we have just changed the matrix and rather than an epoxy matrix, which is the M21, we currently use here the LMPIUK um, thermoplastic matrix. So same fiber, but different matrix and the thermoplastic matrix. Again, we have calibrated the Onera progressive failure approach at the mesoscale, 
considering different tests, tensile tests at zero degree, also compression tests at zero degree, uh, plus or minus uh, tensile tests on plus or 45 degree laminate uh, to calibrate the viscoelastic part. Um, and we have validated the uh, mesoscale approach on that uh, very specific materials. Then we have performed the same at the micro scale. So we have calibrated the Rambert good approach on a tensile test at plus or minus 45 degree laminate. And we have also, thanks to um, um, micrograph, determined the, vo the fiber volume ratio and the radius of the fiber. So we have calibrated the model at both micro scale and mesoscale. And now with the model developed by Jean-Claude Grandidier, we have tried to predict the evolution of the apparent mesoscopic strength um, as a function of the position of the zero degree ply into the composite materials. So first of all, we have manufactured a cross ply laminate that you can see here, and you can see that the zero degree ply correspond to a, the outer ply. If I observe the fiber failure, we clearly observe a fiber kinking in the outer zero degree ply before a kinking in the inner zero degree ply. This failure induces is catastrophic and induce the failure of the other ply after that. For the quasi isotropic laminate, we have observed fiber kinking into the uh, inner zero degree ply. And what you can see, so the curve is normalized because this test has been performed for Airbus, but what is important to observe is the difference between the strain at failure for a cross ply laminate and a quasi isotropic laminate, which is used. Uh, moreover, uh, you can uh, determine that the strength at the ply scale is also um, very different. We have an increase about 25% um, of the apparent mesoscopic strength, uh, which is higher if you consider an inner zero degree ply than an outer zero degree ply. And you can understand that pretty well because in an outer zero degree ply, um, it's easier to obtain a fiber kinking because there is no two ply surrounding the zero degree ply, you have just one. So it's easier to obtain a kinking of the fiber, meaning a buckling of the fiber, if there is just one ply here, rather than having ply all around, which are going to confine the zero degree ply and therefore make harder the kinking of the fiber, the buckling of the fiber into the zero degree ply. Because in the uh, micro-mechanical model, you are going to adjust the characteristic thickness as a function of the position of the ply, we are able to capture that pretty well with the model. So you can see that the nonlinear behavior in the fiber direction is well captured. You can see that the simulation and the test are nonlinear up to the final failure. And the difference between the failure strength is also well captured because of that feature into the model. Since we have test um, two composite material with the same carbon fiber, but different matrix, it is interesting to compare the um, test results. Uh, we have performed tests on a quasi isotropic laminate with um, 24 plies for the carbon thermoplastic material and 32 plies for the T700 M21 material. So for the two, it's quasi isotropic laminate. And you can see that the global rigidity is nearly the same. The initial rigidity is the same, which is mainly governed by the uh, fiber rigidity. But what you can see is that we have a strong uh, improvement of the stress at failure and the strain at failure for the thermoplastic materials. And it puts the stress on the fact that, and we expected that, there is a strong influence of the matrix on the longitudinal compressive strength, and it explains why we have such an increase. But I have to confess that we do not expect a so huge increase into the compressive strength considering thermoplastic matrix. And again, with the micro scale approach, we are able to capture that pretty well because the um, matrix play a major role on the estimation of the um, longitudinal compressive strength at the ply scale. My three last slide will be dedicated to uh, another uh, feature, which is finally the influence of the ply thickness on the apparent longitudinal compressive strength. And to address that point, we have worked on a thin ply composite materials, which is a, a TC33K51, uh, which is a, a, a composite with thin ply. Uh, the thickness of the ply, the weight area of the ply is about 20 gram by meter square. 
This is a collaboration with the University of Bristol, with Professor Michael Wisnum in the framework of the PhD thesis of Tamas Rev. So Tamas has manufactured some specimens, uh, zero degree ply, 90 degree ply, and plus or minus 45 degree ply, in order to calibrate the Onera progressive failure model. And based on that, we have designed a new tensile test which failed in compression, considering the specificity of the material. And indeed, when you work with thin ply composite materials, uh, because the transverse tensile strength depends on the ply thickness, you are going to increase drastically the strength and you can focus your research on the failure and here on the compressive, the longitudinal compressive strength. But you can also play with the thickness of the ply in order to have a competition between transverse crack and a longitudinal compressive strength and to study the coupling and the influence of transverse crack on the longitudinal compressive strength determination. And this is typically what we have tried to address. So we have fixed some objective. We want to study the influence of damage on the compressive strength. And we want that the final failure mode will be still the um, fiber failure in compression in the 90 degree ply. So again, we have uh, performed an optimization process in order to define some stacking sequences. And in the present case, it is very easy. You have just to manufacture a plus or minus 45 degree and 90 degree laminate. So we have decided to consider three different layup, type one, type two, and type four. In type one, you have just one single 90 degree ply surrounded by plus or minus 45 degree ply. In type two, you have one double 90 degree ply. And in type four, you have one quadruple 90 degree ply. So you can you see that we have changed the thickness of the 90 degree ply within the laminate. I have to mention that the total thickness of the laminate remains the same and is equal to 0.8 millimeter. So Tamas has manufactured the specimen and we have performed the test at Onera and we have obtained very nice fiber kinking in all the tested configuration. I have to put the stress on the fact that we have uh, performed, we have obtained fiber kinking on very thin specimen, 0.8 millimeter. But because we perform tensile tests, buckling is no more a problem. We, you can observe that we have a, a, a slightly non-linear behavior up to the final failure. The failure is due to the fiber kinking in the central 90 degree ply for all the configurations that we have tested, type 1, 2, and 4, meaning different um, thickness of the 90 degree ply. And the model OPFM is able to describe all the tests. What you can see on these three uh, pictures is that the strength, uh, the macroscopic stress at failure for the type 1 laminate is higher than that of the type 2 and 4 laminate. Uh, I remind you that the total thickness of the laminate is the same and the macroscopic rigidity is the same for the three different stacking sequences. Only the thickness of the 90 degree ply change. And if you analyze carefully uh, the test and you can see that uh, by inverse identification, we are able to determine with the Onera progressive failure approach, the longitudinal compressive strength at the ply scale. And for type two and type four, you can see that the strength uh, is the same nearly with a very low um, uh, material scattering around 2.8% for the covariance. And for type two and type four performing SEM after the failure, we have clearly observed transverse crack uh, inside the composite materials. But for the type one uh, configuration, meaning a stacking sequence with only single 90 degree ply, we haven't observed any transverse cracks through the entire width, uh, through the entire thickness of the ply. We have just observed few uh, fiber matrix debounding by SEM, but uh, to be honest, we have found five or six fiber matrix debounding on the wall total, um, on the total specimen. So, which is very few. So we haven't observed any transverse crack uh, even after the final failure, meaning that finally this strength, about um, 1200 MPa, seems to be the strength of the material. And therefore, uh, there is a strong coupling between the matrix damage test and the measure compressive strength. So to conclude my presentation, I have presented different tests to determine the longitudinal compressive strength classical one, standard one on zero degree ply, which are, in my opinion, not relevant. 
multilayered uh, laminate subjected to compression, which are um, relevant. We have obtained a, a nice failure mode. We have also considered bending test and a tensile test, which fail in compression. And if you analyze of the test with relevant failure mode, with a micromechanical approach, we have demonstrated that all these tests are consistent despite the fact that the apparent longitudinal compressive strength is different as a function of the applied loading or even as a function of the position of the ply through the thickness of the laminate. About the perspective, we currently work on the uh, influence of initial defect, especially waviness and fiber kinking. Uh, and we currently work on the influence of temperature on the compressive strength. Indeed, we uh, have uh, performed some tests on plus or minus 45 degree laminate at different temperature. Therefore, we can determine the evolution of the plasticity into the matrix, um, into the micromechanical approach, and we are able to estimate the evolution of the longitudinal compressive strength as a function of the temperature, and the test will be performed very soon in order to validate the proposed approach. I have to mention that performing compression test in temperature is very difficult with pure compression test because the rigidity is going to decrease and buckling issues uh, will be um, uh, will be a major uh, point in order to uh, perform a nice test and to obtain relevant um, relevant strength measurements. So thank you for your attention. I apologize a lot for the delay at the beginning. I have some technical issues to be connected, but I will be very happy to answer to your question. And I don't know if the slide will be. Uh, uh, diffuse after that, but I had some reference for those who want to go further on what I have presented. So thank you very much for your attention. That's uh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Frederic. Uh, fantastically interesting and uh, lots of uh, food for thought.